Hey everybody, this is a piece by Maximilien Rubel. It's titled, Did the Proletariat Need Marx and Did Marxism Need... <laughs> did the Proletariat Need Marx and Did Marxism Help the Proletariat? Section 1. 1. The state of permanent crisis which characterizes our century has provoked many thinkers to rethink completely traditional philosophical conceptions and moral values. Among the doctrines that pretend to give coherent and definitive answers to the problems which this reevaluation implies, Marxist ideology occupies an important place. To what extent are the defenders of this doctrine justified? The answer is made difficult by the existence within this school of several currents of thought, each of which claims to be the, quote, true Marxism in opposition to, quote, false Marxisms. Footnote. The original wording of the subject I was supposed to deal with read in a slightly different way. Did the proletariat need Marx, and did Marxism help the proletariat? I must confess that I was in a state of great perplexity in contemplating the problems involved in these questions. And even after having asked Professor Lobkovich for a change in the wording of my subject and substituting in the first question for Marxism the name of Marx, I felt some embarrassment, not because it seemed difficult to answer the two questions, Rather, the reason for my perplexity was simply this. I had the immediate conviction that the questions were unscientific and that I'm dealing with them that in dealing with them I would have to express mainly judgments relating not to facts but to values. But I understood soon that one can treat non scientific questions in a scientific way, that is to say objectively. And since it is my conviction that the concerns of Marx were not mainly or fundamentally scientific, I decided to formulate my answers in a limited number of theses. Okay, so thesis two. In recent years, there have been several attempts to shed new light on all the controversies raised by these conflicts. It necessitates going back to the, quote, sources. In order to grasp the thought of Marx and of Engels, ordinarily considered as forming a single body of doctrine. The first publication in the 1930s of the early writings of Marx constitutes a constitutes turning point in the discussion which today has reached the International Forum. Furthermore, this situation is particularly paradoxical since from this time on, the thought of Marx seemed to emerge after the triumph of the school it brought to life. It, was apparently, it has apparently been a premature triumph since Marxism must now face, in a way, the criticism of a resurrected Marx who is making his voice heard via text ignored by several generations of disciples. Thesis 3. Our intention is to retain, amidst the complex of disputed problems, a theme which seems fundamental to us, both which appears to be left aside in the debates. Excuse me. A theme which seems fundamental to us, but which appears to be left aside in the debates. The proletariat in the thought and vision of Marx. I've anticipated one of my conclusions in order to say that this negligence is in the nature of things. For to reflect on the role of the proletariat in the teaching of Marx leads to establishing a complete break between this teaching and the philosophical and political ideologies which depend upon it. Moreover, by carrying this reflection to its ultimate consequences, one is forced to make a clear distinction between the thought of Marx and that of Engels. In particular, if one considers the latter's attempt to systematize certain theoretical conceptions of his friend. However, the role of Engels in the genesis of Marxism will not be treated in this paper. Section 2. Thesis 1. The principal criticism made by Marx of his so-called utopian predecessors is that his, uto uh, his so-called utopian predecessors failed to recognize the, quote, historical spontaneity, Geschichte, excuse me, Geschichtliche Selbstständigkeit. of the proletariat and did not bring to this group a quote, quote, social science, end quote, a means and ends for its liberation. Considering the workers' struggle as an inevitable result of the working conditions opposed on the industrial proletariat by the capitalistic economy, Marx undertook, as other socialist thinkers had done before him, to bring into the open the historical meaning of these struggles. Thus, while retaining the ethical implications of utopia, Marx elaborated a theory of revolution, never failing to consider himself a disciple of Saint-Simon, Fourier, and Owen, to whom he was linked by powerful spiritual ties. The core of this ethic, based on a social theory, is the postulate of the self-emancipation of the proletariat. 
Thesis 2. Marx conceives the political and economic organization of the workers' struggle in the form of parties, unions, and cooperatives as creations of the workers themselves and not as institutions formed from outside the ranks of the workers by elites, offering themselves as guides of the ignorant masses who are incapable of grasping the meaning of their fight. If the intellectuals have a role to play in the workers' movement, they fulfill it effectively by bringing, quote, elements of culture, end quote, to this movement, and not a ready-made theory of philosophy, an esoteric doctrine of the course and ends of history. However, as, quote, party leader, end quote, Marx no doubt had attitudes which contradict certain principles of the ethic of self-emancipation inherent in his political teachings. Nevertheless, there is no connection between the sometimes ambiguous attitude attitude of Marx, and for example, the conception of the Workers' Party <coughs> held and carried into practice by Lenin, a conception that has been erected into a metaphysics of the party, a metaphysics of the party by Georg Lukács, who saw in the Bolshevik Party and in the Bolshevik Party's leaders the embodiment of the dialectics of history. Three, so, thesis three. Marx espoused the cause of the workers before having carried out a scientific analysis of the economy based on the exploitation of man by man. Moreover, it is the ethic of alienation and not, quote, the law of value, end quote, which is at the basis of this espousal. Historical materialism and the theory of surplus value, two, quote, scientific discoveries, end quote, which should, according to Engels, assure the imperishable glory of Marx, were conceived by Marx after he had already formulated in two manifestos, Sir Judenfrage, of the Jewish question, and Sur Critique der Rex Philosophy. I think that's a critique of Hegel's philosophy, right? Um, whose ethical inspiration is evident. The fundamental criticism of the state and of money on the one hand, and the liberating vocation of the proletariat on the other. Thesis 4. Because the struggling industrial proletariat was cognizant of the defects of the economic system of which it was the principal victim, I had to find spokesmen capable of expressing and explaining the historical and ethical meaning of its refusal to accept servitude. Collective misery and the spontaneous protest of the industrial proletariat gave rise to a movement of thought, commonly called socialism, in which Marx has a special place for having attempted and achieved a synthesis of doctrines that he had inherited. From then on, the importance of Marx lies in the unifying character of his teaching, which aims at the alphabung, in the Hegelian sense, that is, <coughs> the sublimation of the philosophical and sociological reflection as transmitted by generations of thinkers. This sublimation has to be realized through concrete actions and mainly through revolutionary achievements. Man has to prove the truth of his purposes by practical deeds and not by vain speculations based on non-demonstrable hypotheses. 5. Thesis 5. Did the proletariat need Marx? From what we have just said, we might say that this question would have appeared absurd to Marx, and no doubt Marx would have replied in the negative. However, in a sense, Marx had anticipated this reply in his writings of 1843 and 1844. On the eve of becoming economist, Marx proclaimed, quote, We do not face the world as doctrinarians armed with new principles. Here is the truth. Go down on your knees. We submit to the world new principles derived from the principles of the world. We do not proclaim, desert your struggles. They are preposterous. We are going to rend the air with the true battle cry of the struggle. We show the world the reason for the struggle, and that consciousness is a matter one <clears throat> must acquire even against one's will. End quote. Marx. At most, Marx, in order to be able to reply affirmatively, affirmatively to this question, would have placed himself among his, quote, thinking but oppressed, end quote, humanity, that ought to join this suffering humanity, quote, who thinks. It is not his theory, it is not his theory, but the critical theory born before his time, in the form of ideas as well as in revolutionary phenomena, and which he simply expresses in scientific synthesis. This critical theory was, quote, to grip the masses, end quote, by becoming a material force. <clears throat> Section 3, Thesis 1, quote, true or, quote, false. Every Marxism, which claims to be systematized thought, or even a philosophy of Marx, represents a complete alternation of his most profound intention. The thought of Marx could not justify the birth of a political ideology, that is, the transformation of his sociological theses into norms of political action. Neither as, one second. 
neither as sociological theory of a determined economic system, nor as an attempt to reveal the, quote, law of the economic movement of bourgeois society, end quote. There's a footnote I, mix, I missed. Marx's letter to Arnold Ruge of September 1843, published in Deutsch Französische Jahrbücher. The dash after, quote, the principles of the world, end quote, is absent from the original text. As Professor Rubel pointed out in the discussion, he inserted to indicate that the sentence, quote, we submit to the world new principles and so on, end quote, must be taken to be said by the, quote, doctrinarian, end quote, saying, quote, here is the truth, end quote, end footnote. Um, sorry, there's a footnote I missed. This ideology could only be born as a perversion of the ethical presuppositions which confer on Marx's teaching an extraordinary spiritual force. Marx himself apparently had the feeling of things to come when, being aware of the first attempts by his disciples of systematizing his methodological principles, he had the honesty to condemn them in saying, ironically but energetically, quote, I am not a Marxist, unquote. To the Russian sociologist M. K. Mikhailovsky, who pretended that Marx held a philosophy of history in Das Kapital, Marx answered that there was no reason, quote, to metamorphose my historical sketch of a genesis of capitalism in Western Europe into a historico-philosophical theory of the general path every people is fated to tread, dot, 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 end quote. Marx denied then that he had given the key to a, quote, general historico-philosophical theory, the supreme virtue of which consists in being super-historical, end quote. Two. Thesis two. The history of Marxism up to the Russian Revolution of 1917 shows the divorce between an ideological current with revolutionary pretensions and a workers' movement marked essentially by the struggle for reforms within this existing economic system. Germany, with a proletariat reduced to the role of electoral clientele, was the favorite setting for these phenomena. The Russian Revolution of 1917 inaugurates the era of institutional Marxism. The sociology of Marx shows how the, quote, historical necessity, end quote, of the accumulation of capital involves the, quote, historical necessity, end quote, of the proletariat, and therefore the impossibility of, quote, building socialism, end quote, in the Russia of peasants. Marxist theoreticians, however, once they became the holders of political power, submitted the lesson of their master to a dialectical somersault. It is not the disappearance of the salaried class nor the proletarian nor of the proletarian condition, but on the contrary, the creation of each of these that has to be justified at the dawn of Marxism. <clears throat> Three, the appearance of institutional Marxism as a mystifying ideology occurred in accordance with historical determinism which Marxian sociology is quite capable of explaining. By imitating Engels, who liked to involve, invoke the mysterious ways and wiles of history, one could, in the con this connection, speak of the irony of fate. However that may be, the answer to the question, quote, did, Marx help Mar me, quote, did Marxism help the proletariat, end quote, can only be negative. The, quote, historical necessity, end quote, as Marx used to say, of this perversion of ideas in no way prevents its ethical condemnation. A condemnation... And this is the irony of fate, for which Marx himself supplied the instrument. In its institutional form, in the so-called, quote, socialist, end quote, countries, as well, in its speculative as well as in its speculative form, <coughs> sorry, I'm recovering from COVID, so, in the capitalistic world, Marxism today is the negation, or the betrayal, of the revolutionary ethics which animates the work of Marx. The two variants of Marxism, however, opposed the however opposed, opposed they may appear in other ways, incorporate ideologies which unquestionably participate in all the economic, political, religious, and moral alienations that plague contemporary societies from East to the West. One can say that contemporary Marxism in its speculative form is, in relation to the thought of Marx, what contemporary existentialism is in relation to the thought of Kierkegaard. In their opposition to Hegel, Marx and Kierkegaard anticipated the most radical criticism that could be directed against the pseudo-socialism and existentialism of our time. 
It is said and believed that since the 1917 Russian Revolution, the world has entered a new epoch, that of socialism, and that since World War II, one-third of the planet has become socialist. Those who say so and think so generally choose one single criterion to justify their thesis, the abolish, abolishment of private property called socialization of the means of production. But this thesis is confronted by another one. There is no socialism in today's world. What is called so by sheer misuse of terms is in reality only a new and universal form of man's being exploited and oppressed by man. State monopoly or state ownership, which is as deadly as private ownership, if not more so. Instead of, quote, socialism, its name should be, quote, state capitalism, or, quote, mixed economy. Nothing warrants the thesis that the state's control or possession of property constitutes the means and the end toward a socialist order. If we neglect the legally established forms which seemingly regulate human relationships, we discover that man's status and thus the proletarian condition remain fundamentally and existentially the same in the so-called, quote, socialist and in the so-called, quote, free world, unquote. Russian Marxism-Leninism had to justify the exploitation of workers and peasants and thus to build a model for the subsequent, quote, socialist regimes. Section 4. Marx's, quote, science could be used to give a progressive direction to Marxist ideology, whose historical function is to justify the creation of a universal proletariat. But the scientific truth, formulated by Marx as regards capitalism, was not in contradiction with the verdict of guilt pronounced in Das Kapital. The revolutionary vocation he assigned to the proletariat has perhaps been betrayed by the political history of the past one-half century. However, the materialistic interpretation of history teaches us that the proletarianization of the world is the fundamental condition for the ultimate overthrow of things and of values. From this point of view, one can affirm that a universal proletariat, quote, will need, end quote, Marx, that is to say, the socialism for which he fought. Judged by the catastrophic course which contemporary history is taking, this future seems to be appearing on the horizon. We are not far, perhaps, from the situation which Marx thought he had saw, thought he saw in 1844 when he wrote, quote, "In the conditions of existence of the proletariat are condensed in their most inhuman form all the conditions of existence of present-day society. Man has lost himself. However, at the same time, man has acquired not only a theoretical consciousness of his loss." but he also has been forced by an ineluctable, irredeemable, and imperious distress to revolt against this inhumanity. It is for these reasons that the proletariat can and must emancipate itself, but it can only emancipate itself by destroying its own conditions of existence. It can only destroy its own conditions of existence by destroying all the inhuman conditions of existence of present-day society, conditions which are epitomized in its situation." End quote. The end. Thank you for listening.